Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem shortest path in a binary matrix. Given an n by n matrix, so note that this is a square matrix. That's not like a major point, but we will come back to that later. It's a binary matrix, so every value will be either a zero or a one. We want to return the length of the shortest clear path in the matrix. If there's no clear path, then return negative one. So this is a classic situation where there's a phrase that has some explicit meaning to it and they define the meaning down here, a clear path is a binary matrix from the top left to the bottom right. In this case, it's a small grid, so not much going on, but it could be a much larger grid, something like this, and we'd care about the top left, which is zero, zero, and the bottom right is our destination. So we're starting here and we wanna end up down there. Down there is defined as being n minus one, n minus one, because it's a square matrix. Now about this path itself, what's so special about it? Well, first of all, we can only visit zero values. Let's consider the ones as obstacles. So we're not allowed to visit those one values. The interesting thing here is that we can actually move in eight directions. So not just up, down, left, and right, but we can actually move diagonally as well. That's pretty unusual for graph problems, but it won't make things super complicated, not much more complicated than if we could just do it in four directions. So we want the length of a clear path. And a small but important point is that the length of the clear path is the number of visited cells. So if we went like diagonally like this, or if we just went from here down to here, that counts as a path of one, which I think makes sense. So we're not like going by the Manhattan distance where you know this would be a path of two. We're just saying that this is one. Now, what we want to return is of course the length of the shortest clear path. So this is pretty much a shortest path problem. The good thing here is that our graph is a grid, but it doesn't have any weights to the edges. The edges, even though we have eight of them, so for every position here, we can go in eight directions. We don't care about the weight of the edge. So it doesn't cost us anything to move diagonally or vertically or horizontally. It doesn't matter. So we just want the shortest path. Now, the easiest way to do a regular shortest path, this isn't like Dijkstra's algorithm, is just to do a basic breadth first search where we maintain the distance. Think of these as being obstacles and stuff. We want the shortest path to get to the result. Let's make it interesting like that. So we start here. And actually, before I even get into this, let's consider a very, very simple example where we're given a one by one grid, where we basically start at the destination. What would we say is the length of the shortest clear path in this case? Well, we're going by the number of nodes or positions that we're visiting. So actually the return value for this would be one. We say the shortest path length is one. Knowing that we're basically saying to start here, it takes us a path of one. Now, where can we go if we move one position? We can't go up, can't go there, can't go anywhere over here. We can only go bottom right. If it took us one to get here, let's say it takes us two to get here. Now from here, how many other places can we go to? We can actually go in three directions. We can go here, or we can go here, or we can go here. Now, these are kind of dead ends. We can't really go anywhere from there, but from this guy, we can go in one other direction to four here. And then from here, we can only go in one other direction so it took us five moves to get to this spot. And then finally, we end up at the destination. It is a shortest path of six. So six is what we would return. You can think of this as being like layer by layer. This is our first layer. This is our second layer. This is our third layer. This is our fourth layer, fifth layer, and then sixth layer. So we return six. If it's impossible to reach the goal, which would be the case if we were like blocked off like this or something, then we would just return a default value of negative one. Now, what is the time complexity? Well, BFS is a pretty standard algorithm. The time complexity is basically gonna be the size of the grid, which in this case we know is n squared. So that is the time complexity and we're doing breadth first search. So we are gonna need a Q data structure, which the size of that, the max size will probably be O of n squared because we might have the entire graph loaded into that. Okay, so now let's code it up. So the first thing I like to do is get the dimensions of the grid. In this case, it's pretty simple because we have a square 
square grid. So I'm just going to say the length of it is N. And I'm also going to initialize a few data structures that we usually need for BFS. One is a queue and the other is a hash set for keeping track of which positions we've already visited so we don't get stuck in an infinite loop. And generally how we're going to code this up is while the queue is non-empty, we're going to pop left from the queue and we're going to keep doing that and then keep continuing the BFS until we have reached the destination. Now, like I said, we don't want to get stuck in an infinite loop. That's an important point. So we're going to take advantage of our visit hash set. Now there's two ways to do this. First, notice how our queue is initially empty. We should probably add the uh, origin, the top left position to the queue. We can initialize the queue like this. Basically, I'm going to initialize it with a tuple, a single tuple of zero, zero. So this is the row column. Another thing I'm going to add actually is the length for that position. Just to make it a little bit easier, we're going to add that directly to the queue. We could have a separate variable for this, but that would actually complicate our while loop a bit. You can try doing it that way and then compare your code to mine when you're done. The third parameter here is the length. So I'm going to add that and initialize that as one. So we know that to get to the origin, we call that a path length of one. So when we pop from the queue, we'll be popping three values. We'll be popping the row, the column, and the length it took us to get to this position. Now, another point is how do we initialize our visit hash set? When we add a position to the queue, do we consider it visited at the time that we add it to the queue or at the time that we pop it from the queue? I prefer to do it as we add to the queue. So I'll say that zero, zero, has been visited. You could do it the other way. I think it's just slightly less efficient, not in terms of big O time complexity. I think it's the same because we can only go in eight directions. But what I'm getting at is that there are variations of how you could end up implementing this and all of them are pretty much fine. Now, a very important thing about this position is we want to make sure that it's valid. We haven't gone out of bounds at this row column position. How do we know that? Well, if our row is less than zero, or our column is less than zero, we know we've gone out of bounds. An easy way to check this is to actually just take the minimum of the row and the column and check is that less than zero. If one of them is less than zero, that's all that we really care about. Or if we've gone out of bounds, the other direction is the row greater than or equal to N, or rather, is it just equal to N? Or is the column equal to n. And since this is a square grid, we can actually take the max of the row column. If one of these has gone out of bounds, that's all we really care about. So if this is greater than or equal to n, or you could just say, is it equal to n, both of them would work, then we know we've gone out of bounds. And if we go out of bounds, then we don't want to do anything with this position. Now, another possibility is that or this has already been visited, which means our row column is in visit. And the third possibility is that this position is blocked. How do we know that? Well, we take the grid at this position, at this row column position, and is it equal to one? Or we can just you know check if this evaluates to true in Python. I'm going to wrap this in parentheses. If any of these is true, we basically want to skip this position. So I'm just going to say continue to the next iteration of the loop. Now, if it is valid, it could be that we've reached the result. How do we know that? Well, if row is equal to n minus one and column is equal to n minus one, that means we have reached the result. So what are we going to return? Well, we want to return the length. And thankfully, we have the length that it took us to get to this position. So that's what we return. The third and final thing is, and this is important, we want to go through all of the the neighbors of this position. How do we do that? We know that there's eight directions. You could write out like eight statements here. I think an easier way to do this is to define a helper variable. I'm going to call it direct short for directions, and I'm going to define all eight directions. One of the directions is zero, one. I believe that would be moving to the right. And then another direction is going to be one, zero, I believe that would be moving down. But at this point, you don't even need to you know, turn your brain on. You can just kind of turn your brain off and just start copy pasting and then just do all variations of these. We're going to do negative one here. 
we're gonna do negative one here. And this is a little bit more tricky than just doing four directions because we actually have a few other cases to worry about, like one, one, where I think moving a down right and we also have negative one, negative one, and we also have positive one, negative one, and we have negative one, positive one. So those are all eight directions. Now we're going to go through them, the direction of the row, the direction of the column in our directions. What we want to do with this is append it to the Q. So we'd append the row plus dr, c plus dc, and the length it took us to get to this, the length it took us to get to row column was this. So to move one more spot, it's gonna be length plus one. Also, we would want to mark this spot as visited. We can do that like this, r plus dr, c plus dc. The only problem with this is that we're appending every single neighbor. It's okay if we append some neighbors that are out of bounds because we have a check for them here. It's okay if we append a position that has an obstacle because we're checking for that here. But what's not okay is that first of all, we're marking this spot as visited because then this is always going to execute. So we don't actually want to do this. But at the same time, we don't want to visit nodes that we've already visited before. So to fix that, actually we're gonna guard this statement by checking that row plus dr and then c plus dc is not in visited. This spot has not been visited, then we only add it. And I wanna continue discussing this because I think this is how a lot of people can get tripped up. There is a bug here. Notice how when we started things, we said that anytime we add something to the queue, we mark it as visited. We have to be consistent. We do have to add this position as visited. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So we do have to do this. So then what about up here? Well, we can't put this here. It's okay if a node has been visited. We still need to process it, but and we make sure that we don't process a node multiple times because before we add a node, we make sure that it hasn't been visited. Every node will be pushed to the queue once and then popped from the queue once. We'll never visit a node multiple times this way. And that's kind of the logic and reasoning behind everything. Since we're not guaranteed to find a solution, if we end up visiting every node and we don't end up executing this return statement, then by default, we return a negative one value. Now let's run this to make sure that it works. Of course, I had uh, multiple or statements. I had uh, one down here and one up there as I was erasing the other statement. So let's just go ahead and get rid of that and then rerun things. And as you can see, it works and it's really efficient. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to see the code in languages other than Python, check out neatcode.io. It's got a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.